one year. You see a uh, road between these two mountains, that road. Yeah. They do it uh, this year for two months only uh, to uh, separate uh, us between Jerusalem. And uh, there is a big wall between near the road, so we can't go there. A fence, in a road, and oh, yeah. a lot of fence. Oh, I Not see. A yeah, I wall see. Here, here fence, but uh, on the other side the wall, road and the big fence. We can't go there. And <laughs> they refused uh, us uh, to. If you, we want to build a new house now, it's uh, forbidden for us. This is uh, near the road. We can't build. That, that construction there, uh, the, the, the dirt, that area, is that the settlement? Is that new? A new new yeah, building? Yeah, all of this is a new building. This, uh, this For the settlement? This, yeah, this is uh, 2004. Last year. And they all, uh, they are uh, building now. They are continuous building. To make it bigger and bigger. It used to be a forested hill. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, uh, you see the other months there? Yes. Uh, big, all of the trees, uh, this is like this. And these were among the most heavily yeah. forested hilltops in Palestine. <laughs> yeah. So they cut the trees? Yes, cut the trees and make the settlement. They choose uh, the highest and the beautiful uh, wow. lands and make their settlement. Uh, this church, uh, this church uh, is forbidden for us. It is the beginning of Jerusalem. And we are usually to visit her, but uh, now we can't because it's uh, after the fence. And uh, this the green mountain is the beginning of Jerusalem. Uh, this is a settlement, uh, Abu Ghanim, and uh, behind it there's Abu Dis. Abu Dis village now is uh, between her and between Jerusalem. There is a big, a big wall forbidden for uh, Abu Dis. Uh, uh, people to enter Jerusalem and the, uh, this fence is uh, continuous for the big wall. Walling Jerusalem, lining the wall, aggressively applying absentee property law, uh, denying access of East Jerusalemites to the West Bank. Palestinians call this sometimes the Judaization of Jerusalem. It's a term that I do not like. It smacks a bit of anti-Semitism. But the Jaffaization of Jerusalem, turning Jerusalem into Israel, East Jerusalem into Israel, in ways that no Israeli government has done in the past. Because with all of the criticisms one may have of the previous Israeli governments, left and right, we have treated the complexities of Jerusalem with a great deal of reverence. It is my interpretation of these events that the withdrawal from Gaza 
is being treated by Mr. Sharon as an opportunity to allow Israel, number one, to get a green light from the administration in Washington for the clover leaf rooted wall around Jerusalem, which would designate a border establishing an Israeli sphere of influence in greater Jerusalem. To interpret the presidential letter of April of last year in a way that would allow that wall to be lined and to allow Israel to appropriate East Jerusalem and to turn the Palestinians of East Jerusalem into Israelis of the Islamic persuasion. Um, to be fair to Mr. Sharon, with all of his uh, reputation for being a very foxy tactician, which he is, there's very little guile about this. Mr. Sharon believes that it is possible to um, arrive at a non-violent state of equilibrium with Palestinians with this taking place. Um, I believe otherwise and believe this not only to be impossible, but so contrary to Israeli interests. And I'm here as an Israeli and as a Zionist, and not because of my friendship with the Palestinians, as strong as that might be. Uh, so strong that it may jeopardize the very viability of Israel as a homeland for the Jewish people. Because my perspective, contrary to Mr. Sharon's, is number one, that a West Bank that is dismembered into two, a Jerusalem that is hermetically sealed from its natural environs, a wall that dictates to the Palestinians, as we say in Hebrew, are you with us or are you against us? Does not disclose a nonviolent equilibrium. Jerusalem is an enormously stable city. It does not deserve its reputation of being nitroglycerin. It does deserve a reputation of being a small atomic device. It's not every random bump in the road that sets off the city. It is critical mass. And the, what I am describing to you is a change radical in proportions to such an extent that I believe it will destabilize the city. So that's the short one. And there will be a quarter of a million Palestinians who are not members of the World Zionist Organization on the Israeli side of the wall in the Jerusalem area alone. The second dimension is if you believe that the Palestinian people a Palestinian leadership now or at any time in the foreseeable future, 10, 20 years from now, or world public opinion will allow for a dismembered, non-contiguous Palestinian state to take place. Well, fine, I, I don't believe that that will, take, that will happen. But it may well be that we will build so many facts on the ground a wall goes up, can come down. The Israeli government is correct in saying walls and fences are reversible. Line those walls with massive settlement and the irreversible, irreversible becomes irreversible. Now, if you believe that you can establish contiguity by a road or a tunnel, it's the equivalent of saying that you believe in geographical contiguity between a fetus and its mother. States do not establish their viability with umbilical cords. And that is the response that we're hearing from the Prime Minister, in due time, the Palestinians will have contiguity by a road uh, or tunnel that would lead from one part of the state to another. In the absence of a viable and contiguous Palestinian state, there's no other solution, but there is another consequence, and that consequence is the binational consequence. It's not a solution, it's the permanent balkanization of uh, the conflict. Now there's a banton in the Israeli left, and by the way, uh, 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 among Palestinians, we've reached the point of no return. The two-state solution is gone. It's no longer possible. I don't buy that. Certainly not in the Jerusalem area, which I think I know rather well. But if E1 and these other neighborhoods in the south are built, I believe that the two-state solution will be jeopardized to such an extent that there will be no Palestinian state, but there's no Palestinian state. There will be no Jewish state as well. Now, it is not only the root of the wall that has come to fruition at this time, 
but a, a number of schemes to line the wall with settlement activity. The most prominent of this is the E1 plan. Dan will show you the visuals here, but in order to describe this, uh, imagine the Temple Mount being the center of the face of a clock. Ma'ale uh, Dumim in the West Bank, with its approximately 30,000 residents, is the largest settlement in the West Bank. It's something of a consensus in Israel. Ma'ale Dumim will always remain under Israeli sovereignty. And there has been some Palestinian understanding about the necessity of that being the fact. The E1 plan is a scheme if the Harem, the Temple Mount, is the center of the face of a clock, and uh, E1 and the Ma'ale Dumim is at 3 o'clock, E1 is destined to create an uninterrupted built-up land bridge between uh, Ma'ale Dumim and Jerusalem on the 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock quadrant, creating an uninterrupted uh, Israeli band of settlement from East Jerusalem through Ma'ale Dumim on that 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock quadrant. Now, strange things have been happening in E1. Construction began about uh, nine or 10 months ago, illegally. Uh, nobody intervened, and certainly not the administration here in, in Washington. Um, when the matter was uh, brought to the attention to high levels in the administration, once again, the work proceeded. It was only after the Washington Post exposed this by an op-ed by myself and by the reporter in Jerusalem that the works were halted in the first week of September of last year. Since that time, behind the scenes, the Israeli government has taken action to expedite the statutory planning of E1. It has not taken place yet, yet in recent weeks, perhaps for internal consumption in Israel, Mr. Sharon and his spokesperson have periodically reported that E1 is about to take place. E1 could take place if the statutory planning is completed as soon as um, this coming summer, when the plans are completed and the lands marketed. What the, gov the, the government response, the United States government response, doesn't have to tell Mr. Sharon that he's wrong. Secretary of State after Secretary of State, President after President, over 11 years have told Prime Minister after Prime Minister after Prime Minister, E1 is a very interesting idea. It's so interesting that you might want to negotiate it with your Palestinian interlocutor. But this administration, any number of administrations, will not countenance unilateral implementation of E1 because it is the quintessential act that predisposes the outcome of final status at precisely a time when Abu Mazen is trying to consolidate his power. What is Israel telling Abu Mazen? Build governance, create a ceasefire, it doesn't matter. We are going to be using our superior clout and strength to determine what the borders of Israel are, regardless, Vahima. On the Palestinian street, there are already people saying, Abu Mazen is selling Jerusalem in order to buy Gaza. You don't need to be a financial expert to understand the relative value of the stocks on the uh, Arab and Islamic stock exchanges of Jerusalem and Gaza, Al-Quds and Gaza. What the administration has to do is this has to be negotiated. You're entitled to pursue E1 around the negotiating table. The administration is not required to abandon the presidential letter, but to abide by it, saying, OK, we're going to recognize those realities that need be agreed upon about existing settlement blocks. But that is not a green light to radically change the terrain in the interim. We're not abandoning the roadmap to talk about a settlement freeze. We're implementing it. The administration need not invent anything new. It has to abide by what it's committed itself to. And if it does that, uh, I think that we will get through these next months with the two-state solution still alive. Failing that, 
I believe that the decisions that will be made in the upcoming weeks will very well jeopardize the very existence of a two-state solution. Thank you. Now, besides the wall and settlement, we also have the transit points that are supposed to be going around Jerusalem, the design of 11 gates, as I understand it. Could you speak a little to that, particularly I'm thinking of the one uh, separating Bethany and Jerusalem and in Bethlehem, because you are concerned about the term, the Judaization of Jerusalem. The same token as our Christian, I feel what I see going on with the transit points is the idea is that we're going to have segregation, apartheid based on religion. One lane for Jews, one lane for Christians. And as a nun driving to Bethlehem, that leaves me very uncomfortable. You're raising an extremely important dimension of this on two levels. Number one, uh, initially, this was intentional. Today, it's, it may not be, but it's clearly the case. The existence of the wall is nowhere compatible with the dignified and efficient movement of people, goods, and services. It, it's davar uh, v'hipucho, it's, it's, they're opposites. They exclude one another. Um, there are indeed, uh, initially there were to have been two major terminals and that's it, into the city. Uh, given the human pressures, there are now going to be 11 checkpoints. Uh, the 11 checkpoints are grossly inadequate in number, in planning, in scope. I do not see this uh, changing in any significant way. The human, uh, you, there's going to be a humanitarian disaster. Now, let's put things in perspective. Humanitarian disaster of Janine and humanitarian disaster in um, Gaza uh, make what's happening in Jerusalem perhaps pale, but uh, don't make light of it. Um, uh, I'll give you just one small, two, two small examples. I had the opportunity of cross-examining the director of defense project in court concerning one of these neighborhoods with 30,000 people. And I asked him, number one, uh, how many people go through the checkpoint a day? They have a, an ad hoc checkpoint. He answered, oh, we checked that, two or 3,000 people. I said, can't be. I have 11,000 receipts from the bus company. The judge says, on topics like this, you don't argue, you go check. Come back next week and tell us how many people you counted, 23,000. So we're only off by an order of magnitude. Now, the army comes in and says, we're going to build a checkpoint where 1,000 people an hour will be able to get through. But most of those 23,000 people go in and out go in between 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the morning. So they're going to be waiting online for three or four hours. So the planning doesn't anticipate. So that's one level. And I don't see that changing significantly. I don't believe that Israel can possibly achieve by physical means what we're trying to achieve. We can accrue limited tactical advantages for a period of time. But I don't believe that this is going to create a stable state and is going to be workable. The second dimension that you're pointing to is what this is doing to the Holy Land, okay? And when I say Holy Land, I'm speaking to you as a Christian, but for me as a Jew as well. Jerusalem, you know, the only industry that has ever succeeded in Jerusalem is pilgrimage and a secularized version tourism. Jerusalem is a multi-religious, multicultural people. It is clearly not the intention of the wall to, um, uh, uh, to rupture that, but that is certainly the result. And the Christian narrative in Jerusalem today cannot be lived out, I need not tell you that. Uh, and, and the Muslim narrative cannot as well. Um, uh, things that Israel, the first law that Israel passed in 1967 was the law for the protection of the holy sites, to provide universal access. Now, let's not ignore that this is taking place against the backdrop of hundreds of people killed by suicide bombings. We're not living in a Scandinavian neighborhood. But on the other hand, Jerusalem is not Jerusalem anymore unless it have a breathing border where the, where the narrative of Christianity can commence in Bethany and end in Gol or commence at the nativity through Bethany to Golgotha or my Ali al and my pilgrimage. Uh, Jerusalem without its symbols is not Jerusalem, and that is clearly endangered by this. Uh, at the, in the past four years, it may have been a necessary evil. Let's pray that the evil is dissipating and get rid of the necessity. Can I add something? Oh, yes. Yes, um, when it comes to the, I'll use the term barrier, I mean wall, 
to those of you who think it's a wall and fence to those of you who think it's a fence. Uh, the route of the barrier is an issue I've been following very closely, but especially in Jerusalem, I think a little push for the Israeli government to help consider what it is already considering and that this thing doesn't really work and you don't need to be a genius to walk around East Jerusalem around the wall over there uh, and look that this doesn't work but there are other alternatives and the most prominent one is what's known as a demographic alternative if you look at my maps, and I apologize for being so quick with them, it's hard to keep up with Danny here. <laughs> Sorry. What you see here is a proposal by the Council for Peace and Security that goes along demographic lines more similar to what will be the future border uh, if we follow the Clinton parameters. It says whatever's Arab within Jerusalem come under Palestinian sovereignty and whatever's Jewish here blue uh, will come under Israeli sovereignty. And with the original barrier, or at least the government's barrier, following the municipal boundary of Jerusalem, effectively cutting off Palestinians from Palestinians, a demographic line uh, would render that um, free access from Palestinians in East Jerusalem to the West Bank and will cut out, at least in part, some of the uh, grave humanitarian effects of a municipal boundary barrier. Um, there are some problems with this kind of barrier in that, you know, how do you enable, enable access of East Jerusalemites who hold blue identity cards, uh, are Israeli residents, not citizens, but residents, to West Jerusalem, access for work and humanitarian services, social services, etc. But I think this perhaps is more manageable and with one eye looking at permanent status, um, you know, could be a good alternative. Another issue with this is that the internal security apparatus within Israel doesn't see, you know, in really good terms, including 200,000 Palestinians on the Israeli side of the barrier, uh, simply because, or not simply, but also because they will become an inc increasingly uh, hostile um, community detached from its natural environment of the West Bank. Um, I wanted to go back to your, um, your map and you show an alternative um, route for a boundary. Um, in your a barrier. Opinion, barrier, sorry. In your opinion, how would Palestinian people feel about that barrier? They're not going to love it, but it's better. I mean, uh, when you ask Palestinian people, not all Palestinian people are the same. I mean, and definitely you can point, if you have to generalize between East Jerusalemites and then true, if you would, West Bankers, uh, but allowing those, look, since 1967, Israel has encouraged um, East Jerusalemites, Palestinian, to move to satellite towns like Aram, um, around here, Hizma, uh, uh, Abu Dis, and others. And what we have created, we as the Israeli policy have created, is basically a contiguous makeup of blue and orange IDs, namely East Jerusalemites and, and true West Bankers IDs, mixed along this municipal line that was, you know, only on paper. Now this municipal line, because of the barrier, takes hold um, on the ground and affects cutting off this contiguous makeup uh, of Palestinian livelihood, if you would. Um, so uh, allowing that makeup to remain in place, I think, uh, should be viewed favorably by Palestinians. Politically, obviously, they can't you know, encourage surrounding uh, Jewish neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, more large settlements in the area. You know, they can't come up publicly and say this is okay. But this is definitely much better than bear hugging and cutting off East Jerusalem from the rest of the West Bank. We have a family squabble. Politically, I think the line is not terribly different than what we see here. There is no unilateral solution by physical means in Jerusalem. Can't be done. 37, 38 years, every Israeli government tried to create facts on the ground that would make the city inseparable. We largely succeeded. Israelis and Palestinians are like Siamese twins sharing vital and less vital organs. Our mood has changed and we're like spoiled brats saying, oh my goodness, history, historical trends don't turn on a dime. They don't have a steering wheel of a BMW. Well, sorry. 
You know, we created those facts. We now are not capable, I believe, of unilaterally separating out, although Dan's line, in many ways, I believe, has the air of historic inevitability in the framework of an agreement, not outside of it. Uh, so one answer to the answer is that <laughs> definitely the ability of this line to be sustainable is its ability to allow for relatively free access of East Jerusalemites, Palestinians, holding blue identity cards, from East Jerusalem where they reside to West Jerusalem where some of them, probably a significant amount, work. Mm -hmm. the, um, the test cases that we have until now, and I'll put the uh, government's line back up, there are two prominent neighborhoods that have been kept outside of the line. In many ways, uh, Danny Tears, a Sharon's guy for marking the barrier, did divide Jerusalem just a little bit. Um, one is up here, and let me mark it up for you in uh, Kafar Akeb, and the other one is here in the Shuafat refugee camp. Uh, those All of these people are my clients, by the way. His clients. So <laughs> I'll talk. Not to create some conflict of interest, okay, I'll talk fine. about Okay, you this. tell about it, right. Um, now, these are East Jerusalemites. They hold blue identity cards, but their access in and out of the city has been um, not a success story, to say the least. Right. And, um, and so the... the, the, the the president, or if you would, the experience that we have so far with allowing East Jerusalemites to cross from one part of the barrier to the other one uh, was not that good. But again, with a change of strategy and some, you know, help in maintaining high tech passes, perhaps this could be uh, done. One last thing, and not less important, is what exactly does the Israeli government envision, no matter what route you put down, for the other side of the barrier. Do you want to create something new that can sustain itself on the other side of the barrier? Um, or you don't. And especially if um, you go along the demographic line, uh, one proposed by the Council for Peace and Security, uh, you definitely need to help create something true and independent on the other side of the barrier. Maybe I forgot to mention, politically, obviously, this is very explosive. This is redividing Jerusalem, if you would. However, it's redividing it along demographic lines that falls right in place with permanent status or accepted notions of permanent status solution, I think.